outfit is I actually didn't want to wear it today, but um, since I'd already done that a while ago, I thought I kind of had to, so I'm, I had the morning where I'm like, oh, I guess I'll wear this outfit. <laughs> anyway, I taped uh, that a while ago, and I, I have to kind of call myself out on a couple things. The first thing is, if you noticed, in my daughter's room, there were no sheets on the bed, and that uh, is because in one of those, like, both totally just so frustrating and I will possibly shake you but also enduring moments my daughter was sick that night before all over her room and of course naturally the night before before this filming crew's coming I thought, oh I'm going to clean the house and it's going to look you know all these moms and it's going to look so good and then as we're taping and I haven't slept since whatever time I'm like oh there are no sheets on the bed it's moms who will care <laughs> So anyway, so and part of the reason that I that I prepared that for today specifically was because um, I think some of us, you know, are prefaced by these accolades about I'm, you know, pretty good at business and started some big companies and what have you and run them. And but underlying it all is just the normalcy of this is my real life, like this is my actual life, and the other stuff is just the press. This is what I do every day, and this is why I do what I do every day. So I'm gonna start out and tell you a little bit about my story. Um, and then, and I'll dodge this table, I'll do a bit of a round thing, like everyone who has children know they find the circle in the house and just run around that, so I'll do that. Um, anyway, so I'll tell you a bit about my story and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about play and, and predominantly about how play can, can help us as adults and parents um, and leadership for ourselves. And so I, I preface it because I'll forget to do it later with the change in the definition of the word play so oftentimes, and although we've heard a lot about it today, I think it's important to mention that the word play doesn't mean what we think it does. It's not always a ball and a bat and, and that kind of thing. Play is actually, if you Google it, the definition is it's the act of engaging in something for enjoyment without the result of a practical purpose. It's the being, it's the being part. So anyway, so my story starts, um, I'm from Cologne, BC, just up the way. I do come from a line of lots of entrepreneurs, also known as crazy people, and so that's why my family is very normal to me and odd to everyone else. Um, and so, yeah, so I remember being, oh, I'm going to, I should, no, that slide, it comes next. Anyway, um, when I was about five, I went to this little girl's finishing school where you were taught to curtsy and do all these wonderful things. Um, and start with your salad fork, and um, and I drew a picture one day, and it had two sunshines in it, and I recently actually did a TED talk on play, and so if you Google it, you can watch that, but I won't belabor this point, it's just a brief story to, to touch on the beginning of my journey in play. So this picture had two suns on it, and a lovely woman, Auntie Flo, said, you have to redraw that, that's not, that's not good. And I thought, why is this not good? You know, sussing out, why am I bad as usual? And, um, and she said, well, there's two suns in it. And I, for a moment, I thought, oh, she's right. And then I thought, well, this is just a picture. But yeah, this is right. What are you talking about? Um, and so from that moment on, I kind of started to think, what's the difference between what everyone's opinion of the right picture is and what I'm drawing? I recognize this is not real but that's not the purpose of my play. My play is because I'm enjoying drawing suns and maybe I just got carried away drawing suns, but I was in the moment, not in the practical purpose piece. So I grew up, and I'll, uh, this is the embarrassing slide. Yeah. <laughs> so there's me. This is, again, I just bring myself down. So this is me and my fro. I don't know if you can see that. It actually has a shadow on the wall behind it. It's good, eh? So this is, this is me at age nine at my Auntie Barbie's house, holding little Stevie Ross. And so then at age 10, the great thing about my family, because we're so crazy, is that I was afforded the opportunity to play in all aspects of my life. I was given great freedom to be, to be. And so here's me at age 10. I don't know if anyone remembers the Friends era, but this haircut actually came in an adult model on Jennifer Aniston around 1992, but it had more wave to it. So I was slightly ahead of the curve. Um, and then here's me at age 11, and I thought that was just an awesome haircut. And again, this has come back now, but it's in 2013. So I was, again, slightly ahead of the curve. As you can tell, I could also pick my own clothes. So this is, so this was, these were the beginnings of uh, the person that I, well, I guess I always was, but kind of was showing um, the being of myself. And it was oftentimes scary, as we all know, like, 
how kids can be and how the world is, a lot of people looked on the way that I live my life um, or I was myself and uh, I got a lot of opinions. But thankfully, um, my family never backed those opinions up. So my opinion about who I was was always supported by my mom and dad. So when, when I'd come home and say, the kids thought my hair was crazy, my mom would say, well, you like your hair. And it was never about her, it was about me liking my hair. So I really got a practical sense of that, that the support of me being myself. So here's me, this is what, so this is, this is the abstract grilling construction picture. So you can get that part of me. So then I grew up in high school always being a little bit different, but I was also very popular. I was a captain of every sports team. I was head of the grad class, whatever you do to plan all the parties. And I'm, I was the social person. Um, so I was very accepted, but, some, but somehow always slightly outside of the norm, which was, which was a great place to be for me. Um, and so I always worked construction for my family that was originally our family business and went away every summer working construction, did my undergrad and that kind of thing. But how I actually, I shared this story with you so you can understand the kind of failure, like I'm a, I'm a successful failure, I'm a great, I'm good at failing. And it's one of my greatest successes, absolutely. Um, and, and I failed consistently through high school. I couldn't go to college or university because I got such poor grades in high school. I negotiated my way into my undergrad because I said, let me in on academic probation, University of Victoria. Um, and, because I knew the UBC would never go with that. Uh, <laughs> all my smart friends went there. And, um, and so I negotiated my way into my undergrad and they let me in on academic probation. And so I did well the first semester and then failed the second semester. Did well, failed, so that, but that way I could stay at university, but also, um, maintain my failure record. And so, <laughs> very good delicate balance. And, um, and so anyway, so kind of when, when I grew up with this sense of the fact that I wasn't that smart, or I wasn't that pretty, or I wasn't the normal girl I was in construction, or I wasn't, I wasn't a lot of things, there was always this background thing in my mind going, but that's not true. And even though the world told me all these things, I really, had a, a, a genuine sense in myself that my being wasn't all those words that were attached to it. And so the, the things never stuck to me. So although I say I'm a very successful failure, I say that because that's something that you all can understand, but it actually doesn't resonate with me because I don't see any of that as failure. And so it's, it's funny because people say, well, how did you get through that? And I think, well, get through what? Like that was just something I was doing. I don't know. I, Failed Spanish, okay, I'm not good at that. It's pretty straightforward. It doesn't matter. Um, to me, it really doesn't. And I'm happy to tell you I didn't even attend my Spanish exam. I sat on the couch drinking a beer because I knew I was going to fail. So I thought, well, why would I go? <laughs> so here's me. So this is, the, this is the evolution of that person, right? Here's me at the photo shoot for Chatelaine magazine, which was very fun. Yeah. That's what you look like when someone else does your hair and makeup. <laughs> and in, on all of this journey, and then here's ultimately family, my family, and I'll pick this back up in a second. But um, so I'm growing this business. So I did my MBA and all that, and then I, I, I did consult for six months, and I realized I'm a terrible employee, and, I, and I'm not good at slide decks. Um, and I don't like doing that work, so I thought, well, I will do the only thing I know how to do, which is build roads. So moved back out to BC where I'm from because I was in Ontario at the time and married this fellow here who was from my MBA class. And I swore I would never date anyone in MBA school because you know, I was being scholastic. And I, I think we went on our like, second date the second day of school. Um, <laughs> really stuck to my guns there. But uh, anyway, but the point being is uh, I started this business in Kelowna and then about a year and a bit into it, I had Sophie. And so I, I thankfully had her on a Friday, so I took the weekend off and went back to work on Monday. And she was in my office, who I forget, but the speaker earlier this morning was talking about bringing your child to work. And so, but thankfully, uh, my business is construction and nobody will even bother going in a women's closed door room of any nature. So no man would bother me. So I would be nursing on conference calls and all this kind of stuff, but I made it work. And, um, and then I had Graham in a similar nature. He was born on a Thursday, so I got a bonus day. So I went, to, went back to work on Monday. 
And, I, and, and by this time then, actually, we had moved back to London, Ontario, which is where I now reside. And I was commuting with the kids and kids on hips, you know, saying to some awkward kind of banker guy, hold this baby while I sign this multi-billion dollar deal. And he's thinking, what? And, I, and, and it's funny, though, again, these people looking at me thinking, what are you doing bringing a baby in here? And I was like, I don't, it doesn't even register because this is just what moms do, right? Well, like, bottom line, we're doing a business deal today. I have a baby. You want my money. Let's just work this out. <laughs> and so... <laughs> really. And so, um, so that was good and everything was going well and I was commuting and I was busy and purposeful and all this great stuff. And, uh, and my husband, again, to the point of having, a, having someone support, s supporting you is an amazing man and I could do a whole talk on him, but I won't because he'd be upset. So, and then Sammy came along, at Sam, and, um, and two months after having Sam, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And it came down in a really kind of funny way. So I went for Sam's two-month checkup, and the physician said, well, we haven't done your, your pap. You should go. I said, oh, man, I have all these kids with me. Like, I'm too busy. Forget it. I'll reschedule. And she said, I know you. You will not reschedule. <laughs> I'm thinking, God, yeah, why does this woman know me so well? And um, so she said, I'll have the nurse watch the kids, and we'll do your thing. So fine. So I got a call, like, however many days later, three or four, you have to come back in. Okay, fine. Irregular cells. Okay, fine. My best friend's had this a thousand times. No big deal. Sailing, sailing. And then the call after that was, you have to come in tomorrow. I thought, that's not good. So my husband joined me. We went in and we found out that I had this type of cancer uh, that's very rare. And the survival rate is very small. And it doesn't respond to chemo or radiation. And, you know, kind of from the first cell split to when it's curtains is 18 months and we don't know how long you've had it and we don't know anything. So I'm like reduced to crumbled, you know, sludge on the floor. And, um, but my first thought was, oh my God, I'm having no more babies, which is funny because I didn't even think about my own life. It was just that like having children was the best thing I'd ever done. And now there was going to be less of that. So we went to a second appointment, at which point the doctor came after a couple of biopsies and said, actually, you don't have cancer. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> so I, I am like, start the car, let's go. <laughs> and Andrew, the balanced Andrew, this is why like, if you're an entrepreneur, marry someone who's really calm. So he, or just like normal. And so he, <laughs> so he said, he just said, are you sure? And the, looked and he said, actually, I'm so sorry. I read the wrong file, you do have cancer. This is what I said. So then, so then, I, so then it got really clear. I thought, okay, then this is for sure and for real and it's absolute. So I went home and I called my parents and my brother and I told them and I called my insurance company and said, please tell me that this deal I'm putting together for work with the bank cannot be pulled because it's supported by my life insurance policy and they cannot pull my policy now even though I'm pretty well guaranteed to be dead because I had worked all this time on building my business and I just couldn't imagine all those people who dedicated their lives to supporting my vision, just having the rug pulled out from under them like that. So thankfully I'd been paying a long time for an expensive policy that you can't pull. So that was good. And then I thought also, why am I commuting like this? Why am I doing all this stuff? What is, all, what is this life that I just had? Like it was, what? And so I like sat on my kitchen floor rocking, crying, and I just said, to, like, I am getting back to the being part and not the doing part. Like, the being part is I'm being myself, I'm staying alive. It's that simple. So I shelved all the doing, which meant cleaning my house, finishing putting the laundry away the day that it was processed through the machines, all these things, including running my business. So I called my dad and said, Dad, you're, I learned everything I know from you. Would you like to unretire and come and run my business? Um, and naturally, as you would if your child was doing what I was doing, you said yes to anything you need. So there he is. And so um, I, I had surgery, seven hours, came out alive. Um, and thankfully, I'm well, and it's been a year, and so far, no cancer. Yeah, thank you.
I give all the credit to the man on the knife. I pretty much just stayed still. Um, so, but the point of, of, of the story in, in a lot of that is after I, was, after I got well, I sat there and I thought, you know, why, why would I consider my life a success? When you, like if anyone's kind of confronted death or had someone close to you pass away, you, you get to those kind of like very basic questions, what's my life about or what am I doing here and blah, 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 blah. And so I was thinking, why is it that I consider my life successful? If I die, I'm actually okay with that. It's bizarre. Outside of my children, although thankfully they would have someone amazing to, to guide them. And it, it really kind of came back to this really basic being piece around my own leadership of myself. And that I was exposed to myself and I learned about myself and I understood myself through play. And it started when I was small and my parents giving me an open canvas onto which to paint my life. And anything that I created was good. The same way we look at how our children do it. You know, they create whatever it is and the stick man is glorious. Um, and it's started to resonate with me that my whole life has been viewed by myself as that, you know, my Spanish failure was good. All these other things I didn't attach to what the world was attaching. And I thought that is brilliant. I would have never got to where I was had I questioned all these failures and all these things and the crazy, you know, terrible haircuts and the awkwardness and the whatever. And the Kelsey, how do you do it? And I just think, because I'm just in the being part. I'm not concerned with the doing part. And so I think when it, when it goes back to the fundamentals of the play mentality, that's where I think it is. I mean, obviously, I have a business doing it. So I think it's pretty important we play. But I think it's, it's more important that we share that being of ourselves with our children and that they see you in the being of your own leadership. And I'm going to say that again because I think it's important that they see you in the being of your own leadership. So instead of thinking of the doing part, the do the right thing, the do the nice thing, really that, whatever it is, that intuition piece, the part that you know in your heart, the part that is okay with not registering there for soccer because every other mom did, that part you know is your true path for your life in front of your children, that's the part that I think will make all the difference in how your children see the world that you show them. Because you really are their guide, right? You're the guy giving them the tour. This is the world, folks. Here's this, here's that. Here's failure, or here's not. Here's your canvas, does it have two sons? Is it right, is it wrong? I don't know. But that's the being part for yourself and that your children see that, I think is so important. So I'm gonna go through just a couple of slides so that I don't get off track, because I just can't, can't talk for a long time. So this is the part, to be the person you want your children to see in the world. You know, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world, which is a huge aspiration. I am no Gandhi, I never will be, I'm not good enough. But, no I'm not, I'm a little bit selfish. Um, <laughs> I am also honest. Um, but, but to me, I think this is totally obtainable. You know, I can be the person I want my children to see in the world. How is it that I'm to tell them do this or do that if they don't see me being it? And then I'm that universally. I'm nice to the fellow on the street. I'm nice to the man in my office. Like it's that core principle being part that they witness and you expose them to. And I think it's so important. And, and if ever I have to make a decision in my businesses or my life or any time, I always, and I'm wavering between the good and the bad, I always imagine my children sitting there watching me do it. And that sure helps, you know? It's like, check yourself, mom. Is this, is this the lesson? And then, the, so this is a part about the you, the turn your love and caring towards your own deepest desires, so the being part. When, when I am in my effortless leadership self, when I'm running my businesses and my life and my family and beating cancer and doing all these things and people are going, how are you doing it? And I just really think, what are you talking about? I'm just being myself. And it, to, it, to, you know, the press looks spectacular about it, but it's, I get up and I change my kid's diaper and I clean up the vomit 
and I do what, like I just just but it's always me in the center of doing it in a way that's genuinely myself not in a way that's on presentation for or doing because the doing like that word is a nasty little word um, and so and so to today I think the the resonating mes message has has been about being a leading mom and leading your children and, and I'm hoping ultimately the piece that we can take away is about leading ourselves because we again are the window through which our children see the world and so I think leading moms are not made in the doing we're made in the being we start with ourselves and through that then we can change the world around us through our children and their legacy and through our own so that's it that's my story